Okay, um, let's have everybody be seated. We're on the air, and I think I have everyone here. So, uh, good evening. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. It's 7 p.m., and we're ready to begin the Town of Estes Park Board of Trustees board meeting. And I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please, so we can all stand up. And we have a very special graduation ceremony, so I'm going to come down front, and uh, we've got our CIA participants here tonight. So, Well, welcome. Let's see if this is on. It is. Well, welcome tonight. I'm pleased to welcome the participants from our Community Information Academy, better known as the CIA. So you're all agents now. Um, over the past two months, these civic-minded residents have gathered us with us to gain a behind-the-scenes perspective of the town's government work for our customers and the community. They have diverse backgrounds and interests, are busy with their own jobs and families, as well as volunteering in the community. The fact that they took a significant amount of time to engage in the CIA to further their knowledge of local government in their community is truly commendable, and I personally thank all of you. Kevin? Thanks, Mayor. Is that on? All right, I just can't hear it, that's troubling. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank our public information officer, Kate Miller, and our management analyst, Susanna Simpson, who helped to organize and facilitate uh, the CIA class. We really appreciate the time you spend on that, and it is not a small feat. Uh, the group of graduates you see before you today spent time with Mayor Koenig, Trustee Marchink, uh, myself, Municipal Judge Thrower, former town attorney White, and every town uh, department director. And I know all of them enjoyed their time uh, with all of you and appreciated the good questions and feedback that you had for their operations. They also had the opportunity to meet with many of our local government uh, district partners and find out how we all work together uh, to do good things for our valley. Uh, many of our CIA participants are already contributing energy to um, important local causes. You may see some of them tonight in uh, other aspects, and I suspect we'll see more of them in the future contributing as well. So thank you for your dedication to uh, this program and also to the town and the community. It's so nice to see you all here today. We had some hurdles this year with weather, and luckily we made it to tonight, but this, this is the hardy part of the group, and there are several who couldn't make it tonight, but um, we'll go through all the names here in just a moment. But I just want to say thank you. Um, that was an investment in your time, and it was a lot of fun. And I think for me, CIA is enjoyable because we get to go out and show like what makes it fun to be public servants. And I see enthusiasm in you guys for that, so I appreciate that. And we all learn, um, the staff learn from you. Um, and our elected officials as well, and hopefully you learn from us as well. And I think uh, this is a, a nice step into uh, civic involvement for some of you, especially those who are new into town. So thanks for spending that time with us. And I um, also want to, again, thank all of our staff and the mayor and Trustee Marching for spending time um, with the group. There are a lot of other departmental staff that welcomed you for the facilities tour, too, and that was um, that was a lot of fun, so we, we appreciate your involvement once again. And I'd like to ve very much thank Eric White with the Estes Valley Library. The library was our partner for the first time this year, and they hosted the series, um, which was wonderful and very helpful. So I thought Eric might like to say a few words as well. Thanks, Kate. Um, 
yeah, I want to congratulate all the graduates. And uh, when the town approached us about partnering on CIA, we were excited because it fits right in with one of our missions, which is to promote civic engagement in the community. Um, and I got, I got to be the best of both worlds. I got to partner on this and be a student. Um, I learned a ton, and I appreciate the town bringing this to the community. And uh, yeah, we'll be excited to work on it again in the future. We really appreciate your help, Eric. Um, now I'd like to read off your names, alphabetical order. We have a certificate from you. Um, if you could come down, I'll hand that to you. We have a couple hands to shake, and then if you wouldn't mind wrapping around here, we'll get a photo at the very end. So we'll get started with that. Uh, first, Mr. Jeff Bailey. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. Hand sanitizer has been used. Okay. Um, Bill Brown. Marsha Campbell. <laughs> Mel Causer. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Christy Crosser. Scott, Seth, Jarman. <laughs> Seth in parentheses, there we go, thanks. Um, my uh, unofficial official assistant, Dana Klein. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for all of your help. Uh, Lonnie McDonald. Maggie Rothermel. Sarah Washington. And Jackie Wesley. I have a few names I'd like to read from uh, the people who couldn't make it tonight. We also had in the class Laura Jane Bauer, Chris Greenwald, Jim Haluska, Maddie Koth, Avril Kumar, um, Hannah McKellar, Christine Winokur, and Trevor Whitler. So it was a hearty group. It was a really great group. So thank you. Now we'll we'll kind of line up. If I could get the board to stand uh, behind everyone, we can. Eric and Jeff, this way. I need everybody to get a little bit closer.
So with the snow, we can all go home now. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> we, we need to stay. Um, let's go ahead, and I'd like to have the agenda approval, please. I move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, let's vote. And it passes unanimously. So let's uh, move forward. At this point in time, we have public comment on any item that is not on our agenda tonight. So does anyone have any public comment they would like to state? Come down, give us your name and your address, please. Good evening. Good evening. I am Steve Kruger, 1715 Greyhawk Court. Just wanted to thank uh, those of you who attended the first responder initiative that we kicked off last, or last Wednesday at Solitude Cabins and Lodge. Also want to thank you for all the support that you've shown this organization. Um, it's a relatively new thing and we just appreciate all the time that's been invested by our community. Um, on behalf of Catherine, who is uh, stuck in some sort of traveling snafu, okay. she sends her very best and she wants to thank everybody up here and she wants to thank the entire community for the support. Uh, she was really impressed with the turnout last Wednesday and just really felt like the community uh, was just very much in, encouraged and uh, loved what they heard and uh, she plans on being up here more often. Yeah. Uh, currently, Kaylin and I are setting up uh, appointments with our lodging colleagues. Uh, we're able to start populating the Valor Vacation website with some great Estes Park offerings. And again, we just want to thank you and hope that Valor Vacations Restoration Ranch will always have some roots here at Estes Park. Okay, thank you so thank much you. for getting involved in all of this. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Anyone else? Hi, come on down, give us your name and address. Hey, good evening. My name is Bruce Darby, uh, Hi, 642 Bruce. Aspen Avenue, Estes Park. Yeah. And uh, just, I was a letter writer for the uh, open position. Wanted to put a face to the name and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. Uh, anyone else? Come on down, Christine. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good I'm evening. Christine Poppets. I live at 650 Devon Drive. Um, I came to just for a couple things. I wanted to thank, thank you to the mayor and to the police chief um, in acting on the written attack or harassment on me. I believe uh, personally and or on the group that I'm involved with that happened last week. Um, there is an ongoing or a, an investigation going into it and um, I feel personally attacked and harassed and I just thank the mayor for helping me get it in front of Chief Hayes and hopefully we can find the person responsible and there will be adequate punishment. Um, on a lighter note, I wanted to say that we have 1,080 signatures on our petition just to give you an update. Um, I know you're all thrilled to hear that. Um, and again, invite you, Prep, PEP, Preserve Estes Park has a meeting again this Thursday from 5 to 7 at the American Legion. PEP is Preserve Estes Park. Preserve Estes Park exists to act as an advocate and source of resources for the communities of the Estes Valley of Colorado. It is comprised of families and individuals concerned about maintaining and improving the environment wildlife and the quality of life in the area and is open to all who share the same concern. It is a nonpartisan, diverse, and inclusive group and welcomes participants from all backgrounds who desire to keep, to work together to keep the park in Estes Park. So that is the meeting, that is my group, and I thank you all. Okay, thank you. Do we have another comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward on the agenda. And um, uh, we're ready for our town board comments. And you know, trust me, Miss Alpine, I'm going to start at the other end just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> she always gets hit with that. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> um, one thing that I actually had an opportunity to talk with um, uh, Deputy Town Administrator and uh, Mayor Koenig about during this week's or last week's mayor chat, uh, I was reached out to by Deanna Farrell, who is the current uh, vice chair of the soon-to-be-sunset Family Advisory Board. She just made some general recommendations on 
kind of like the onboarding and sunsetting process when it came to all advisory boards. Uh, I talked to both um, Jason and Wendy about it, and then I also mentioned it to the Transportation Advisory Board. My plan was to just send those recommendations out to the Town Board, Transportation Advisory Board, because that's soon to be, um, I think, our last advisory board, at least for right now, um, and town staff through the clerk's office, uh, just for feedback. Um, and to see if there's interest in moving forward and implementing those into the new bylaws or standards for onboarding uh, advisory board members in the future. Um, be careful, I'm gonna probably say it all the time, when it comes to the amount of construction that's happening in and around the Estes Valley right now. Um, the detours, the traffic, it's, it's, it's um, only gonna get worse, it's only gonna become more challenging as our tourism season really hits. Um, make sure you're taking advantage of our transit opportunities whenever you can to keep your car off the road. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, just be patient, um, be kind. There's a lot of people that aren't from up here. So um, please do uh, just think about all the workers that need to get back to their families and so on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I have several things on my list tonight, but they're all fairly quick, so I'll try to burn through them. Um, the first is just I uh, want to echo congratulations to the CIA grads. I went through CIA in 2019, and uh, it really changed my perspective of what we offer as a community from our municipality and also just um, all the ways that everything works together. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to honor you tonight. I know that's a long program. It takes a lot of time and effort, so um, kudos to you. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, Steve Kruger was here. I was able to attend um, the presentation he referenced last week talking about restoration, ranch, and va valor vacations. And just as a recap, that's um, an effort that Steve and his wife Kay um, are working on in conjunction with our police department on how to make Estes a welcome place for first responders to come and take time to rejuvenate and just restore themselves and their families. Um, and it's just, he's working really closely with the lodging community, visit Estes Park and the chamber to just kind of establish Estes as a safe and comfortable space for our first responders. So it was a great presentation. I'm looking forward to supporting the work that they do there. I also want to thank uh, Manager Soulsby for her presentation to the library staff last week. Uh, she came and spoke in front of the library to talk about uh, parking and transit for this summer and just making sure she's getting in front of uh, as many uh, downtown touch points as possible. It was a great presentation. The staff was uh, really um, appreciative of your time and just want to give you kudos for that. Thanks for all you do to be in front of various groups in our community. Um, as far as my liaison reports go, the EDC, we had an executive committee up, uh, meeting last week discussing the transition plan for not only new staff, but also for our shift to a seven member acting board um, with our investors still involved um, throughout the year. Uh, we have another meeting on Thursday about a potential interim CEO, so hopefully we'll have some good news to share uh, after that. And then we have a couple of meetings in May to kind of tie up some loose ends and, and shift us into this next step. So looking forward to reporting back on that. Uh, restorative justice, we have a meeting Thursday morning in this room. It'll be our first time meeting in person for me ever since I've been a liaison, but also for that board since COVID. So it'll be great to see everyone's face. And my last item is just to remind folks to get out and vote. We've got three great elections going on right now. Um, it's really important that you, uh, I'm from Chicago, so it's really important that you vote early and vote often. Um, and make sure you get all your ballots in for the various elections, um, ballot issues, and board members. Um, lots of ways to have your voice heard right now. So please get your ballots in. And that's it for me. Um, not too much. I, too, attended <coughs> the program uh, for the Valor and the Restorative uh, Ranch. And it was a great presentation. Excited about uh, what they're doing. And Stephen and Kay are putting a lot of energy into that. And um, I have no doubt that our community will step up and um, be, be a top-notch um, contender for the top uh, Colorado community to uh, be present on that Valor website. Um, as far as my liaison on the police auxiliary, um, Matt Thursday, um, they have a lot of events coming up. Uh, of course, summer is a huge time for our volunteers and we couldn't do it without them. Um, and so um, just keep that in mind when you're seeing them out uh, helping with the elk, uh, you know, season, calving season's coming up. Um, 
just thank them for, for all their volunteer hours because they sure do save our, our town a lot of money. They have the hours um, put in. I can't remember how much it was last, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago we mentioned how many dollars that they do save our community. So um, their training, they have training uh, every time we have a meeting and their training um, this last Thursday was on the elk and um, the uh, calving. And that was put on by uh, wildlife um, officer um, Chase. Um, so um, he took his time to come. He usually comes about twice a year, uh, fall and, and spring, uh, to bring us to bring them information on how do they how they can um, educate the community as and more so the visitors on um, safe watching. So that's all I have tonight. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. So the rooftop rodeo parade, uh, rooftop rodeo, rodeo. Um, <laughs> let me just go back. The rooftop rodeo parade is going to be go. <laughs> July 6th. Um, so it's coming back. We haven't had it in a few years. This year's theme is a cowboy salute to the armed forces. Um, so it should be really nice. Um, the uh, next meeting of the rooftop rodeo committee is Thursday, April 27th which is this Thursday, um, at 7 o'clock at the event center. And, you know, they need volunteers for the rodeo days, old-fashioned, like people that want to work every night at the rodeo or if you just want to work a few nights at the rodeo. It's a really a great organization, and it's really a, a wonderful group of volunteers. So um, we have a little reorganization this year with we have a coordinator for the entire rodeo, and um, it's being run a little bit differently, but the whole fun behind the volunteer part is all the same. So what we do is we really welcome anybody who'd like to just see what's, what it's like and what you can do. And you don't have to be, you know, a, a wrangler to be in the rodeo. I mean, you can work tickets if you want. But there's so many positions that we need people that would be great if you want to volunteer to please come and show up at the meeting. Um, and that's it for me. Okay. Barbara. Almost last but not least, <coughs> uh, three <laughs> small items. I attended, <coughs> excuse me. I attended the electric vehicle ride and drive event, which thanks to um, Vanessa Soulsby for putting that together. It was held during the Bigfoot Days Festival, rather <coughs> rather a chilly day, but it was um, it was great to see some of those little cars sitting there waiting for people to drive them. And uh, we had the pleasure of trying out a Kia Nero, which I had never heard of before, but it was very smooth. As I told Vanessa, it would be great in the um, summer and probably the fall here, but it's two-wheel drive, and for our driveway, it would have been a dead issue, so <laughs> we're still looking, but we'll get there. Um, anyway, I think it's great that the town is supporting, uh, letting people know what's out there in terms of EVs and what they might want to do about that. Last Tuesday was the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, started out with a study session that was focused, once again, on aspects of the missing middle, also known as medium density housing. And that was followed by a regular meeting in which the main agenda was, um, as it turned out, re-electing the officers for the next, for the coming year. So Matt Comstock, Comstock will continue as the chair and Matthew Heiser will be the vice chair. And then the last item, um, last Wednesday night, I attended the EV Student Nature Film Festival. This is put on through the Land Trust, but also with the school district. I mean, it's a kind of a combination thing. There were 12, mo 12 movies produced by uh, high school students. I'll have to say, the students in this day and age are way beyond anything I ever saw as a, uh, for years and years. In any event, it was very impressive. Some were a little bit better than others, but it was uh, a major endeavor on the part of the students. Nature film was the emphasis. There were a number of them that really dealt very specifically with environmental issues, and that was good to see. Uh, the one that wasn't exactly nature was skateboarding. I guess that's nature if you look at it in a different way, but that one was <laughs> quite interesting also. And the thing that I took away from it, in addition to the fact that these kids really know how to do stuff that's impressive, was that um, they had some interesting comments about what town, what the town and really what town government is doing. And it was fine for them to say that. It was a little bit critical, which I'm always good for criticism. Um, 
I think that they didn't know some things that maybe they either learned in the process or still don't know, but the films are going to be available at some point, and I think I will be sending links to some people here um, within town government who might get a bit of a charge out of it, but might also want to figure out ways to get out a little information more effectively because uh, some of the concepts were way off the wall. But anyway, it was a good experience, and I uh, this was the second year they've done this, and I... I'm pretty sure they will continue, and they had a reasonable amount of funds that are going to be awarded to the top three films uh, sometime in May. Uh, Bird and Jim was behind the funding on that, so um, kudos to all of them, really. It was kind of knocked me off my feet. Thank you. And um, I'll give the final report. Uh, I went also to the first responder meeting, and it was wonderful to see all the involvement in the town and you know we forget first responders are across the board in all organizations in town really you take care of all of us and you help each other take care of us so it's an opportunity for maybe our community to help take care of you when you've had a rough rough patch and I think that's really very important so I kudos to Steve and his wife getting that started and connecting and uh, Chief Hayes also came, which was really nice to see him there, and he was able to talk to all the officers from Lakewood that had been involved in the original incident. Uh, the meeting that I have this week is PRPA. It's in Fort Collins. It's not tomorrow, which I'm really glad about with the snow coming down, but it will be Thursday, so I'll be driving down there on Thursday morning. And um, I'd already reported on some of the other events that I had been in. So we're gonna move forward now to the town administrator report. Hi Mayor, I don't have any comments this week, thank you. You were on vacation, did you have a good time? That's a comment. <laughs> I did, thank you. Yeah, it was nice welcome. to catch up with my family and it was much nicer where I was than where I am now. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> From a, sorry. Yeah, thanks Travis. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. It was 70 <laughs> degrees down there. <laughs> And I come back here to snow. In July, when it's 110 in, down there, I'll be much happier to be here. Yeah, you yeah. always say we're like family. And just now, you understood that we're not just like family, are we? <laughs> I'm glad that my review happened a couple of months ago. Yes. <laughs> Maybe she'll forget what just happened tonight. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move ahead to the consent agenda. And we start off with the bills. And second item is town board minutes dated April 11th, 2023, town board study session minutes dated April 11th, 2023, and town board strategic planning study session minutes dated April 5th, 2023. Third item is the family advisory board minutes dated March 2nd, 2023, and special family advisory board minutes dated February 24th, 2023, acknowledgement only. Fourth is Estes Park Board of Adjustment Minutes dated January 3rd, 2023, acknowledgement only. Fifth, Estes Park Planning Commission Minutes dated January 17th, 2023, and Estes Park Planning Commission Study Session Minutes dated January 17th, February 21st, and March 21st, 2023, acknowledgement only. Uh, 2023 Art and Public Places, AIPP, Yarn Bombing Application. Uh, resolution 42-23, setting a public hearing for a change of location for a tavern license, liquor license held by Montego Bay Enterprises, Inc., doing business as the Wapiti Colorado Pub from 247 West Elkhorn Avenue to 1350 Fall River Road, Estes Park, Colorado, 80517 for May 9th, 2023. Resolution 43-22, setting the public hearing for a new hotel and restaurant liquor license application for Montego Bay Enterprises, Inc., DBA, the Downtown Eatery, 247 West Elkhorn Avenue, Estes Park, Colorado, for May 9th, 2023. The ninth item is Resolution 44-23, setting the public hearing for a new hotel and restaurant liquor uh, license application for Ole International Kitchen, LLC, DBA, Ole International Kitchen, uh, 145 East Elkhorn Avenue, units 300 to 400, 304, Estes Park, Colorado, for May 9th, 2023. Tenth item is correcting the appointment of Richard Dowling to the Estes Park Board of Appeals for a term expiring May 1st, 2025. 
Is there any member of the public wishing to have any item removed from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd like to have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any other comments from the town board? Seeing none, let's go ahead and vote, please. And it passes unanimously. Let's start with the reports and discussion items from outside entities. New initiatives for future success, Estes Park Museum, Friends and Foundation. Eric Adams, Estes Park Museum, Friends and Foundation, Inc. President. Hi, Eric. Hello there. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for being here tonight. Right, it's, Hello, it's me. Eric, <laughs> I've reached a point where I'm going to pull these out just in case I need them, but we'll see. Maybe I'll pull it off without them. Uh, good evening, trustees, Madam Mayor, administrators. Thank you for the opportunity to share what the Estes uh, Park Museum Friends and Foundation is doing. On behalf of the Friends and Foundation, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Board of Trustees for including in your strategic plan within the Outstanding Community Services goal, the statement that we will preserve and make accessible the history of Estes Park to understand how the community became what it is today and to make informed decisions about its future. The mission of the Friends and Foundation supports, uh, the, the mission supports this through uh, fundraising and advocacy for the Estes Park Museum. Now I'll go through some uh, kind of a broad overview of the organization. Start out with financial support. The Friends provide roughly twenty to $25,000 on an annual basis to the museum budget. This provides funds for museum services that include exhibits, programming and education, collective collections care, museum advertising, and the printing of the members only newsletter three times a year. The Friends have also committed to contributing at least $10,000 annually to the ongoing project to digitize newspapers. This is a double match to the town's $5,000. Another contribution is that the Friends uh, apply for grants on behalf of the museum that they may not be eligible for as a municipality. These grants are sought out based on annual project needs. The Friends have fundraised since 2016 to contribute towards the professional collections and research facility. This will happen with upgrades to the museum annex facility. The Friends donated nearly $100,000 towards improving the building foundation to support the preservation of more than 30,000 artifacts which are valued at over $2 million. Another $400,000 has been raised and is set aside to spend during 2023. That money will be uh, put towards a new HVAC system, installation of new security cameras, uh, installation of a new fire and security alarm system, LED lighting, and potentially the installation of a compact storage shelving units. <coughs> With these improvements of the annex building for collections and research services, it's important for the town to budget for maintenance to protect uh, the valued assets inside. Having a, having a facility at museum professional standards ensures the preservation of artifacts for posterity and better sets the museum up to achieve its mission. Volunteers. As we know, volunteerism in this town is amazing and we have our fair share. Volunteers serve on the board and on committees and uh, subcommittees. There are four standing committees, the executive, investment, advocacy, and fundraising. Within these four committees, there will be several uh, subcommittees that will include membership, events, press, and table setting. And I didn't know what table setting was either until recently, but uh, talk to me and I'll tell you all about it now. <laughs> uh, membership. We wouldn't be where we are without our members, and currently we're at 389 members. We hope that each and every one of you are a member, and if not, uh, please see Christy Crosser, because you know she'll bend her arm just as hard as she did me to get me on this board. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, a little bit of the history. The Estes Park Museum Friends and Foundation Incorporation was established in 1979, and it's varied in its title and organizational structure over the years, but always with a focus on supporting the museum. The town took over museum services, and the Friends became the primary nonprofit support for the museum. Right now, we have a transition board in place for this calendar year. 
Previous boards for the past 16 years had an employee. When this employee resigned, there was a void in daily services which the immediate past board stepped up to fill. Unfortunately, daily operations consumed enough times uh, and the governance of the nonprofit uh, was overlooked. The previous board has voluntarily resigned after approving new bylaws and a mission statement and making a financial decision to close the museum shop. In order to install a new board with a focus to better align the organization with museum goals. The current board is interested in forming a subcommittee to consider reopening a retail shop at the museum. And another priority is to sell the remaining then and now books authored by historian laureate of Essence Park, James Pickering, with Mick Klinger and uh, museum director Derek Fortini. In order to accomplish these uh, priorities, the transition board will focus on good nonprofit uh, governance, sustainable practices, and new policies to ensure consistency with an emphasis on partnering with the museum. In short, our job is going to be to get the groundwork set and get a framework set for a new board to come in uh, in the next year. <clears throat> Prior to the resignation of the previous board, they had the foresight to adopt new bylaws, and this has allowed for an organizational restructuring as we're talking. Currently on the board, the president is myself. The vice president is Nina McGivney, here in the back. Secretary Christy Crosser, right back here. Why she was on the CIA, I'm not quite sure, because I think she could have taught that class, probably. <laughs> Our treasurer is David Hemphill, and we have a director at large, Jan Gelhausen. <clears throat> so what's next? Appointed committee chairs will be meeting with current volunteers and existing subcommittees to establish goals and budgets. With those interested in retail opportunities, a plan, goals, and budget will be discussed and developed after a decision is made to open a shop. The board is excited about a new web page on the museum's website, thanks to museum staff Michaela Fonden for her design skills. A grant application was submitted to the Village Thrift Shop, that uh, powerhouse of grant uh, giving here in our community, to partnership with museum staff. And this was for supplies to properly store valued historic loose photographs, and that grant has been awarded. Most importantly, however, the Estes Park Museum Friends and Foundation will continue to partner with museum staff and support the museum's strategic <coughs> initiatives, including working to adequately staff the museum to its fullest potential. So that's a brief overview of what we're looking at doing, how we are organized now, and how we plan to move forward uh, from here throughout the next, for the rest of the year. Uh, there, uh, we'll see how much action takes place as we move forward, as we get everything kind of set and the framework uh, created to help guide a new board uh, coming on into the future. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Have any questions? You guys are busy. We are. Yeah. 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 I, I'd just like to thank you all for stepping forward on this. Uh, you, you filled the vacuum, and it looks like you've got a lot of energy, and we appreciate that. Thank you. And my arm was in a sling here recently. That, our tiniest board member twisted so hard, it was just now it's getting back to going back here. <laughs> Anyone with any other questions? Thank you very much. Very and we look forward to seeing all the progress you're going to make. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and. Um, Discuss resolution 45-23, opposing Colorado Senate Bill 23-213, and we've got Attorney Kramer. Thank you, Mayor. So I put this down as an action item, even though we had direction from the board already, uh, to bring back a resolution opposing this bill, in case you all had any questions or in case I had updates to share. Because as we talked about last time, when uh, you all directed us to advocate against the bill and bring back this resolution, the bill could look very different at this time than it did at that time. The truth is there's been so much going on with this bill that it's hard to isolate exactly what is changing and what is not. And that's not just because the amendments that have been put forward are so lengthy. It, there's been a storm of them. There's another committee meeting for the Senate Appropriations Committee tomorrow. They may make a number of very significant changes to the bill. On the other hand, they may not. We don't know. The Senate Housing and Local Government Committee met and did recommend amendments as part of the committee report uh, to the body, the Senate as a whole, 
That was, I believe, last week, early last week. And that would change a number of things about the bill, a very extensive amendment. It would change a couple of things regarding accessory dwelling units, but it would leave most things the same. So that's a recommendation. Uh, unless the bill is changed extensively even further, that would most likely become part of the bill that the Senate adopts whenever the Senate as a whole takes it up. So that would change a couple of things about the ADU provisions, namely the size requirement would change to 500 to 800 square feet, regardless of the size of the principal dwelling. And also the setbacks would change. You might remember the setbacks were very small, a maximum of five feet. It would become the same as anything else uh, required for a single family dwelling in the zoning district. So those, those were changes, especially the latter one, that would probably be welcomed by the town board. At the same time, at the moment at least, all of the other provisions regarding accessory dwelling units uh, are recommended by that committee to remain the same. So without any official changes to the bill at this time, I wouldn't recommend any different course of action than what the board was considering at the last meeting. Of course, anything can change moving forward. But with that storm of uh, amendments and uh, the potential for all kinds of changes, uh, I just wanted to give you that update and see if you had any questions about it. So you're recommending um, using the resolution 45-23? Correct, Mayor. You have in your packet a resolution that would take a, a formal position of the town. We have been advocating with legislators on the town board's position, but a resolution is really the formal way to do that, and we could communicate that to legislators as well. Of course, we're not recommending that the town board oppose the bill. That's really a town board policy decision, uh, but we can advise on different aspects of that. And if you would like to oppose that bill, and yes, I recommend this is a good way to do that. To do that. Well, it says the town of Estes Park opposes the adoption of Senate Bill 23-213 and urges the members of the General Assembly to eject, reject it. So we are opposing it in this resolution. I think he was saying that staff's position isn't that they could support it. Yeah. Right. It would just be us making that decision. Right. Right. Correct. So. Okay, any comments? Do you have any sense of where this is going? <laughs> it's been real interesting to watch. Trustee McAlpine, if I were a betting man, I would sit this one out. Oh, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> This has had so many changes in momentum, changes in direction. It has been pared down. Uh, the, the bill as a whole it almost went away at one point, according, of course, to rumors. Mm. And uh, I, I could not make a prediction on that. I think that we may learn a lot tomorrow with the Senate Appropriations Committee hearing. And, and are you watching those hearings? Trustee uh, McAlpine, I am watching parts, of, I should say, <laughs> listening to parts of them because <laughs> video is not online. Oh, okay. The last one lasted seven and a half hours. Yeah. And <laughs> no, I I listened to the, to the pertinent portions of that after the fact. Yeah. We'll give you lots of credit for using judicial judgment. <laughs> That's good. Do we have any comments from the public? Anyone who'd li like to speak on this, welcome to come to the mic. Okay. Then um, I'm requesting a motion and a second. Regarding the resolution. I'll make a motion to approve uh, resolution 45-23. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Either uh, Any more comments from the board? Seeing none, let's go ahead and vote, please. And it passes unanimously, so I guess you get to present that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, we will communicate this to our legislators. 
I should also note that I will continue to advocate for this bill to have less of an impact on the town of Estes Park, even if it does pass in some form. Thank you so much. Mayor, may I just make a quick comment too that for folks who are wondering, you know, we're referencing a lot of the discussion that we had um, in our last meeting about this that I'd encourage folks to go onto the town's YouTube and if you have questions about the comments that were made there, I think a lot of us aren't repeating them because it's the same conversation that we had at that last meeting, but I'd like for folks, if they're interested, to go and listen into those because I yeah. think it gives a lot of insight on, on why we are so firmly in this direction. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I know actually, uh, Prior Mayor Troxell has a whole item that he's doing in Fort Collins, getting people to sign on, and they're opposed to it. They feel the bill just takes away the individual town's rights to make their own decisions on their property uses. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what it deals with. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our next item. Um, I'll turn to the correct page. We have uh, setting the public hearing for ordinance 04-23, amend, amending chapter 14.12 of the Estes Park Municipal Code to adopt the 2022 editions of the international codes, including the international building, residential existing building, um, fuel, gas, mechanical plumbing, property maintenance, energy conservation, and swimming pool and spa codes with amendments. I don't think it deals with alcohol within the spa, does it? So it will not be quite so jovial. I okay. hope not. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor um, and trustees. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to have a, what we're hoping is a fairly brief discussion um, this evening that's really built on the many discussions that we have been having with you over the course of the past year or so. So I appreciate your time and your attention tonight. I'm going to, I have many people behind me that can support this. I also have some people to my right that can support this, namely uh, Dan Kramer, who is our town attorney, and he's been enormously helpful as we've been wading through um, the complexity of all of these codes. We have Christine Brinker here, who is a code consultant, and she has been helping us out. Um, I do believe that her participation in the last meeting was enormously helpful to clarify, um, especially with our energy code. So. We're back up tonight to focus and to have a little bit of a discussion um, in order to clarify our direction as we set the public hearing. And this has been a learning experience for myself as well. Uh, this is the first time that I've adopted building codes, so I appreciate your patience and everybody else as we've been working through this process. It has not been fun. Um, but I do believe that the end result is going to be um, what we're all hoping for, uh, and that it's also the result of a lot of good, thoughtful dialogue with the community and also with the board itself. So again, tonight's meeting, we're setting the public hearing. What that means essentially is after tonight, and we, are, we have some questions for you before we are off to the races, we will be um, bringing this back to you on May 23rd to adopt the suite of building codes um, with some clarification after this evening. All of the information is gonna be available in the clerk's office, so any member of the public that may want to come in and learn more about those codes, we invite you. Um, they'll have all of that information. All of the code books will be there. We are always available um, in community development, pardon our mess upstairs, um, to answer any questions should any of the public need to get with us. And then we're also planning on a discussion with all of our contractors prior to May 23rd so that we can answer questions and clarify any confusion that may be out there, because I'm sure there is. Um, so, in your memo, we actually had four different options that we laid out that we would like you to consider, and really this, this discussion is going to be about that, as well as the discussion about sprinklers. That is located in the IRC. Um, we were directed to leave it as we had presented it to you in a study session, gosh, uh, two sessions ago. Um, but we are coming back because we want to make sure that we have that clarity from you. And if you wanna go in a different direction, that's fine. We do have some folks that would like to speak on that. Uh, but those are really the issues that we wanted to talk about tonight is just um, addressing the energy code and those appendices that Christine really helpfully brought up to us in the last discussion. Um, our staff recommendation based on uh, researching all those various options um, and then answer any questions that the board may have. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so. 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to, these are uh, the appendices that we were talking about um, that are sitting on the screen. And there are essentially four that Christine mentioned to you. And what staff is presenting to you at this point um, are two appendices that we find the most useful with respect to the energy code, um, the 2020, 2021 energy code. So there's appendix RB. You can see all the language there. This is um, solar ready provisions and then appendix CB, which is solar ready zone for commercial. So basically the difference between these two are residential and commercial. So hopefully that's relatively clear. Mm -hmm. um, the board may obviously, you have lots and lots of options. What we're hoping to do is narrow this down a bit that of these particular appendices, we also have another option, which is the board could choose to say, okay, we're, we'd like to adopt the 2021 energy code with these two appendices, Appendix RB and Appendix CB. Or the board may choose to say, let's adopt the 2021 Energy Code and the Colorado Model Electric Ready and Solar Ready Code, which is essentially supplanting those two appendices. It's, there's so much overlap between the two that staff felt like it, was, um, it would make more sense to go with one or the other. Um, so we are also here today to answer any questions that you may have about that. That was all in your packet. Uh, Christine is here also if you have any questions, as well as Gary Rusu, who is our chief building official. I'm going to keep going. If you have any questions, please stop me. Um, staff does not recommend adopting appendices RC and CC. I'm not going to get into too much detail about this because I'm learning about them as well. But generally speaking, what from what we are aware of there are, there's only one municipality in Colorado that has taken on, I believe, only one of those appendix appendices. Um, so we would like to take a little bit more of a conservative approach and go with the other two appendices or the Colorado solar, I can't even say the entire code, um, the previous page. I'll arrow back to it. And now I'll arrow before that, or next to it. Okay. The other options that we have that are in your staff memo, before I continue, are there any other questions about those particular appendices? Because we can go back and address them right now. I yes. have a question. Can you clarify, go back to the previous slide, please? So I'm confused as to what number two is, if it is, if it has RB and CB in it. So they, uh, Trustee Youngland, they, they, uh, this Colorado model electric ready and solar ready code, as I mentioned, would actually be, it would supplant them. So it would, it would be the substitute in lieu of those two appendices, mm -hmm. this would replace those. We feel like there's enough of an overlap mm -hmm. um, between all of these things that we feel it addresses all of the issues that those two appendices actually cover. So there's really no, um, no significant difference I, in, I will not the say way specifically, read. but I will lean back towards my colleagues and say, come on up if you would like to clarify that. Mm -hmm. But to my knowledge, it is not significant enough for us to point anything out of note. And, and within okay. that question, it does not require solar to be installed, which I believe RB that is the and case. CD, that's, that's yeah. an important piece of that, I think. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Trustee Senna. Uh, just, um, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm usually into the less regulations, the more. Um, so, and, and if you just remind me again, because it got so confusing with the RBs and CBs and IECs and, you know, all these letters. Um, I know we're required to kind of accept one of them, because then if not, we're going to accept the building code that's farther ahead eventually. I, I get all that. Mm -hmm. But... Why are we plussing the appendices? I mean, why, why couldn't we just go with the, I, the, the 20, 2021 IECC and not add more regulations onto us than, than not? So, Trustee, you might have, you, you, you skipped ahead in my presentation, so I will get to that. <laughs> okay. um, the, the board has discretion over mm -hmm. what you would ultimately like to adopt. We are bringing it to you and also including it as we set the public hearing because that was requested by the board at the last meeting that they wanted okay. to see all of it. So it's really a question of after tonight, if you have any questions about it and would like to clarify, we can provide that information. And then what we're hoping to do is take your direction. We will prepare our ordinance to reflect that direction. And then we will bring that back to you in a public hearing on May 23rd. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and something yes, I kind of like to just remind because I looked into this a little bit more and on the solar ready provisions, I was concerned how much money does that add to the cost of building homes, particularly if we're also using it for our housing uh, homes. And my understanding is it's really running a conduit to the electrical hookup box and being sure there's enough open space that if someone wants to add solar, they can. However, most solar companies, which happened at my house, they come in and they just do an external plug-in to the power box. So this is something that seems like it's really complicated and wonderful to do, but it's at this point in time, it's not because they don't have to use the conduits that are put in and it adds a few hundred dollars to the cost of building the home. So I think a lot of us don't understand. You think they're going to run lines all over the house and they're not. But the important part, as I understand, is it allows trusses to be installed that would support the solar panels. And that part's probably more important than the conduit, I would think. Is that correct? Mayor, I am not going to answer that question. <laughs> I'm going to let Chief Building Official Gary Bruce to speak to Okay. That. Thank as, you. As far as the location of solar panels, it will require when they submit their plans to build a home that they designate the area the solar panels will go. And in that design is when they'll beef up basically the trusses to handle any extra weight. It's not a lot of weight. I mean, we put them, they're putting them on roofs now that are, you know, 20, 30 year old roofs without having to do that. The panels aren't very heavy. So that's, that's that part of it. The other part, like you said, is the conduit and stuff. The idea is to encourage the solar companies to use what's available. But we have found in a lot of jurisdictions, they're just running them upside, up the side of the house over and, and in, so. Okay. But it, it, it's available. Um, and leaving that extra spot in the panel box for the breakers so that the cost down the road is not there for the okay. homeowner. Thanks for clarifying that. So I have, um, I tried to read this stuff. If I were quizzed on it, I would fail and there's no question about it. Um, but, and I won't ask you to do this. <laughs> I'm sure you'd rather pass <laughs> the buck you. and that's Trust cool. Thank you, Trustee McAlpine, I thank you. <laughs> but I, I would just be interested in hearing some of the very major differences between the Colorado model electric ready and solar ready code versus the RBCB. Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Just yes. Yeah. You got it. Well, how about this? Um, why don't I, I'll run through the presentation and then we'll ask Christine to come up and she can provide that kind of okay, clarity. I think you. she's going to, she's going to do so much of a better job than I could. So, uh, but we'll, I'll just get through this just so you have kind of the full, um, and if any other questions come up, we can just, we can just uh, get them all taken care of at the same time. Uh, okay, so we already talked about RC and CC. And then what we're at now, this was in your, in the staff memo. Uh, these are the various options that we presented. Um, and there could probably be more, but we were just trying to kind of refine this based on the conversation we've had. So the first option is that we just approve the adoption of the 2021 IBC and the related codes with amendments that we're gonna be presenting on May 23rd, including the optional energy code appendices CB and RB. The section, uh, sorry, the second option is to approve adoption of the 2021 IBC and related codes with recommendations I'm just going to skip that part. Excluding optional energy code CB and RB seems pretty simple. Next one, option three, and you'll notice this is bolded and highlighted because this is our staff recommendation um, to approve adoption of the code with amendments presented, including the Colorado model electric ready and solar ready code and schedule a study session to discuss the possibility of adding appendices RC and CC as well as electric preferred provisions presented by SWEEP, and that was Christine, at a later date. And this is really based on um, what we know of with the, the looming deadlines, with what we need to address and what we would like to address prior to July 1st, and then what gives us a little bit more flexibility after we've been able to adopt all of the, all of the codes. 
The fourth option is really providing that leverage back to the board um, and to address Trustee Sinek's question. The Board of Trustees, you can postpone adopting any of the codes. You can direct staff to revise any portions of these codes. And I just want to say that is obviously, we would ask you that for any, if there's anything that comes up as you review, we're happy to make any amendments. Okay, so that, those were the, that was related to the energy code. And then my last slide is really just addressing the IRC ad, um, code language that addresses sprinklers. So it requires all new single family homes, two family homes, duplexes, and townhomes to have sprinklers installed throughout the residence. I will repeat this, all new construction. Should the board decide to revise this requirement, staff can make the amendment prior to the public hearing on May 23rd. Currently with our IRC, we limit sprinklers to two family homes, duplexes, and townhomes. So the change would be that we are adding single family homes. That is the distinction. And that was my last slide. So that really concludes our discussion. Um, I can go back to any of the slides that you need to. Um, I will invite Christine up and also um, Chief Building Official Gary Rusu again. And we're happy to answer any other questions, especially with respect to CBRB and how it interacts with the uh, model solar ready, solar model electric ready and solar ready code. I'm gonna have to create like a song or something. That's a lot of words, so thank you. Um, Thank you. I have one quick question as it relates to the IRC and the sprinklers and single family homes. Mm -hmm. um, how does this impact, and I, I, I see what I'm reading here, but how does this impact future ADU development? How would this impact single family homes if an attached ADU is attached to a single family home? Does that definition change? Does that all of a sudden have to be retrofitted? Does only the new construction need to be sprinklered? Does now the entire home need to be sprinklered because there's shared walls between those two structures or two uh, living spaces? Um, I'm just thinking how, I mean, sprinkler systems could be cost prohibitive. Um, I know that construction is only getting more expensive moving forward, not cheaper. Um, and I, I'm just really interested specifically in the ADU, or the ADU part. Okay, thank you, Trustee Martin, for your questions. Um, I will ask Gary Rusi to come back up and answer that for you. That's a good one, though. Okay. He can answer the same question I have with yours, if that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to add a question that's just going to go to yours. With that, um, if we decide as a board that, uh, say we decide, and we may have talked about this last time, but we talked about so much stuff. Um, if we decided that, um, you know, we, we would adopt it, except for, say, we didn't want a little, like, we didn't want single family homes to be required. Does that have any problem with the state? Or is that, so we could decide that and, and not be a problem to state to decide that? Right. Okay. The, the state's really only involved in the energy portion of it, not oh. the building portion. Okay. And to answer your question, any new construction, so if they're building a new ADU unit attached to the home and the home is sprinklered, then it would need to be sprinklered. If the home currently is not, then it wouldn't need to be. It Same way, it would not need to be sprinklered. So if you did an addition to a home that's, un, that's not sprinklered, you wouldn't have to sprinkler the, the addition because the rest of the home is not. So it's basically a new home from the ground up is what we're... So is that inclusive for the entire property? So if an ADU mm -hmm. is a detached ADU, so... If it's totally an ADU that's built as a new portion of the new home. It would be a detached ADU, not... A de detached. Detached. Right. It would still need to be. That Any would... new construction so even would have to have that as a single family. Yes. Okay. So even though the initial residents did not have a sprinkler system included... No, 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 no. Only if the, exist, if the new structure has a sprinkler system, then the ADU would need to be sprinkler. I just want to make sure that's very, very clear. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, it, it, the purpose is if you're going to have an ADU and your home sprinkler, you would want that done also. I mean, it just would make sense, but it's not a requirement. So. Okay, so back to that question. So if you have a house that's not sprinkled, whatever, and you decide to build an ADU, you don't have to sprinkle that, even though it's a single family home, but because it's called an ADU, it doesn't have to be. If, if we pass the same, this is what I'm not getting. 
It's, yeah. If we, no, it's not. It does. <coughs> if, if. <laughs> I, I think I got this. Here we go. I think I got this. I thought so too until you said the last sentence. If you have a single family home that is not sprinkled and you're building an attached ADU, it does not have to be sprinkled because it's attached to an unsprinkled single family home. Okay. If you have an unsprinkled single family home and you're building a new oh. detached ADU, it has to be sprinkled. The ADU has to be sprinkled. It's a new structure. But, but not the home. Structure. But the home, the original home does not. Right. Yeah, exactly, that's why it got me confused. It seems opposite. Yeah, Thank if you. it's a new structure. Right. Okay, got so. it. <laughs> I don't like it, but I got it. Okay. New standalone structure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, you brought up the sprinkling and all hell. Okay. Can we have her come up and? <laughs> so I, uh, I, I will go back to the uh, appendices and then I will turn it over to Christine. Hi, Christine. Thanks for coming up on kind of a stormy night. Uh, sure, yes, thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad we get to dive into this a little bit more. Very good questions. Uh, as I recall, the question was about the difference between these two, between the appendices and the Colorado Model Electric mm -hmm. Gradient Solar Ready Code. Um, the Colorado Model Electric Gradient Solar Code essentially contains Appendix R, B, and C, B. Almost identical. It tweaks a few things here and there, but nothing huge. Um, and so those are uh, in the Colorado Model Electric Ready and Solar Code. One difference is that the Colorado Model Electric Ready and Solar Code had an additional filter. Uh, the, the appendices were developed at the national level through a, a three-year process involving literally thousands of building officials and construction industry trades. And then the Colorado Energy Board took that and took it through their own Colorado-specific filter to develop the, the, the model code. So that's one difference, is that it was just tweaked and customized a little bit for Colorado as opposed to national. Mm -hmm. The other more major difference is that not only does it contain the solar ready appendices, it also contains electric ready language which uh, means that each um, water heater, if it's a gas water heater, would have a little plug near it where someone could plug in an electric water heater in the future if they'd rather have electric. And then there's also room on the panel similar to the solar situation. And then the same for a stove. If a new house has a gas stove, they would also have a, a plug that could support plugging in a, an electric stove, whether that's a, a conventional one or an induction one, it doesn't matter, but the plug would be there, so you could plug it in, and then room on the uh, electrical panel. And as far as cost of those, um, costs vary, but they, they're they saying around $300 each. Um, there would also be um, panel capacity for the furnace, if someone wanted to put in an air source heat pump, but if they're already putting in air conditioning, that's electric anyway, so that's not necessarily an extra cost because a heat pump would replace a furnace and an air conditioner. Mm -hmm. So that electrical part is already there. So that's why I started with just the water heater and the furnace. Okay. So that's a major difference is uh, that is, is in the model electric ready and solar ready code. And then also in there, even though it's not in the title, are some um, uh, EV ready requirements, which is for a single family home, again, an outlet in your garage uh, where you could plug in an oh, EV, right. not the actual charger, because you'd have to buy that if you buy an, an EV, but at least a place where you could plug it in. And that's, um, even though you can plug it into any outlet you want, it, it charges a lot faster if you have essentially a dryer outlet um, where it could charge it um, in a few hours instead of many hours. So the wattage so that, is higher. Yeah. yeah, so those EV ready requirements are in there as well. Okay. And uh, uh, so that's the difference. These appendices up here are just solar ready. The Colorado model code is that plus some basic electric ready and EV ready components.
It seemed to me that the Colorado da 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 was easier to read. Was that just because of what we were being fed, or was it actually more? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, that was in the packet. Uh, is it is it actually a little bit easier for a, a lay person to kind of get a handle on, or is that a dumb question? Um, well, good question. Uh, I don't know. I think they're all interesting personally, so it's hard to say which is easier, <laughs> which is not. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. You had mentioned 300 a piece. Is that for? Uh, can you clarify what you're what you mm -hmm. mean by a piece? Yeah. So um, according to the cost estimates, uh, your mileage may vary. Um, 300 for water heater, 300 for a stove, three to 400 for the EV. And, and they don't usually count anything extra for the furnace. So that would be 900,000. So th this is just electrical for dummies. Mm -hmm. When yeah, you say yeah. don't count anything more for the furnace, you mentioned about air conditioning. Well, a lot of our houses don't have air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't mm -hmm. putting an air conditioner in, would it cost more to do the electrical for the heat pump? Um, right. If if it's a brand new house and it does not have air conditioning, and then lay, uh, then they would, yes, put in um, a plug and panel capacity for a future air source heat pump. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you say 200. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Sinek, your mic is on. Oh, okay. So my issue is this. Um, it, it's not really an issue. It's more of a question. And when we say 300, is is that, uh, how solid is that number? Because I can tell you, when I get an electrician out to my building or my house, it's always more than 300. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's putting in a plug or whatever. So I'm trying to figure out where that 300 number is coming from. Um, and if it is, maybe I can get the number for the electrician. <laughs> right, right. Good question. Um, uh, I think you you hit on a very key point, and that's if you're calling an electrician later to retrofit in these systems, it is a lot more complicated because they have to go through walls. They have to rip up walls. You might need a new panel. You might need new breakers. It is a lot cheaper uh, and easier to do it as you're building the house itself. So that's why the price seems lower than what you'd expect if you were just calling an electrician to come in later. How solid are and the numbers? And get those numbers from I builders. I mean, that's what I'm saying is, mm -hmm. and I get mm -hmm. the thought that it should be that much, but right. when you're actually building a building and they give you the bill and you're like, well, right. it's just more. It's like $600 right. more. So yeah. I mean, how solid are the numbers? Are we getting those numbers mm -hmm. from our, our local mm -hmm. builders or is it like a national builder amount? I mean... If I had to characterize it, I would say it's in the middle. It's not pulled out of thin air, and it's not drawn directly from Estes Park builders, um, but it's numbers that have been circulating widely um, without mass opposition of pushback saying they're completely unrealistic. So I'd say that they're kind of in the middle as far as solidness. And, and I trust that, you, that that's what your thought process yeah. is. But I guess before I want to really make decisions, I'd like to know mm -hmm. kind of in this area. Right. Because if I build a house right. in Podunk, West Virginia, mm -hmm. or I don't have to pick on West Virginia, Podunk anywhere, uh -huh. it's going to be generally cheaper than Estes Park. Right. You know? Right. So I just, if we're going to go by numbers and costs, mm -hmm. I don't know how could we do that if we just even ask builders what they think with the average. I don't know. But it would be mm -hmm. helpful for me if I'd know what here that cost would be and not mm -hmm. a national right. or sure. what we think. And it, you might be even more. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But right. if we right. could get that somehow, that would be easier for me. Right. And we talk about even even the ER stuff, the RB, CB stuff, and, oh, it's just a conduit. Every time I was building my building, it was just a conduit. All of a sudden, it was $1,000 more. I'm like, I could go buy a conduit for $10. Why is it $1,000 more? I'll put uh -huh. it up there with super glue. So, <laughs> right. you know, I just kind of get, mm -hmm. you know, I get nervous about those things. Sure. When we just say, oh, it's only about this much. Right. Mm, really? So if yep. we could maybe just ask builders for that average, that would be great for me. I don't mm -hmm. know everybody else needs that, but I kind of need that. We could ask builders, for instance, what it costs for them to put in a dryer outlet, since that might be similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something like that might have less um, 
um, bias, I guess, since everyone, almost everyone wants a dryer. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it, it's perfect for me. I just mm -hmm. would like to know that I'm, I'm making a decision based on prices here and not. Yeah, sure. I don't sure. think you came up with an error, but I, you know, national right. average is definitely not maybe our average. Yeah, exactly. So. That, oh, so one, one more addition on that. The, the EV one where we said 300 to 400, that one is more solid because that one has gone through several other cities' processes where they got local estimates. Um, the 400 was from Fort Collins and the 300 was more from Denver. Um, so I, I feel more solid on the EV one than the uh, furnace, water heater, and stove ones. Sorry. And, you know, it's helpful for me that it's not, mm -hmm. you know, you're not saying, oh, there's a range from 200 to 2,000. <laughs> right. I, I get that. Uh -huh. You know, if it's yeah. $50 difference there and there, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if it's a lot different, you know, it's yeah. just nice to be able to make that decision on that. Definitely. Well, and then with the electric vehicle, I have an electric vehicle. We, we had the outlet in the garage but needed to convert it because my husband turns wood, so we had lots of higher voltage mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. But it was $2,100, just so you know. And that we didn't have very far to go. It probably mm -hmm. had 30 feet to go through the garage. So getting it done earlier, I don't mm -hmm. think we'll find something that approaches, you know. No, that, I that get that, not, but it's us thinking I'm it. I'm just not, thinking yeah. about the car. That's all I'm oh, thinking Oh, no, 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 it's yeah. perfect. I just, you know, like I said, that, that's the difference is it's what we so think it is. I'm not arguing. I, I'm I agree. I've lived up I wouldn't, I've lived I wouldn't up take here. on that argument because I'd lose it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, it would just be nice to know what it locally is. That's all. And it's not blasting anybody it's just if we're gonna throw out numbers it would just like to know if that if y'all talk to numbers that's that's great that's what it is sometimes you got you got to realize the cost is depending on the size of the house mm -hmm. so if you have a 4,000 square foot house and you have to run conduit all the way across the house to get to the kitchen it's on the other end of the house and why that's going to be higher so this is based basically on the an average 2,000 square foot house normally your furnace, your water heater, that's all in the same room now, the mechanical rooms. So the distance from the panel is a lot shorter. Uh, just so you know, most places that have gas appliances do run a receptacle now for an electric range, along with it. That was done yeah. prior to any of this. Right. Take the high side, take $500 instead of 300 you're talking fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars up front, as opposed to maybe five thousand, ten thousand later. So, because it's being put in when the house is being built, so it's just running an extra wire and conduit, and it's not all in conduit. You got to realize that because it's residential, it's not required to be in conduit. It's a Romex wire. Commercial is a little different. Right. So. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's give the public a chance to come up and ask some questions if I can on this. I think we're pretty well through this. Do we have any questions from the public that you'd like to ask Jessica or anyone? All right, let's go ahead and move forward with this now. Um, I guess it's time to request a motion. And a second related to these changes, how, what direction would you like us to go in? I'm not really pr uh, pr proposing a motion, but um, I I'm not um, convinced that I would like to see the sprinklers in the residential, um, single family residential. Um, and uh, as far as the RB and the CB, um, I feel that uh, just going with the straight code, we can always add those um, as well as the Colorado at a later date, if, if, if that's correct. Um, if, we, if we just pass the 2021, Without the RB or CB or Colorado portion, we can always add that. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, sorry. Or would that so make us be? I'll defer work. to the attorney. Trustee Youngland. So the the one advantage of going with 
the 2021 Energy Code and the Colorado Model Code is that that's what's going to be required anyway after July 1st. So we can make any changes after that date at that point without worrying about it. If we were to adopt the 2021 Energy Code and not adopt the Colorado Model Code, then if we were talking about making changes, any changes would have to involve adopting the Colorado Model Code. Mm. Okay, thank you. So really the decision is now or later. Yeah, I, yeah, a few months, right? It's a few <laughs> so, months. Huh? It's a few months. Yeah, yeah. a few months. So with, with that clarification, then um, I think it's a kind of a no-brainer for it to be included, in my opinion, with the Colorado Code then, but I am not wanting the sprinklers in the single family. So I am opposed to the sprinklers in the single family. But I have a question about that, if I can ask real quick. It might be better for uh, Chief Wolf um, to answer it. It may not, whoever can answer this is fine. Um, if, if you have a sprinkler system in your house and say you burn something in your stove, just for clarification, and the times when everybody's done it and you had to open all the doors and your alarms are going off and everything else, will that set off a um, sprinkler system? Uh, no. So uh, sprinkler heads are activated by heat. Okay. So they either have a bulb that goes off at a certain temperature or a fusible link that melts at a certain temperature. So typically to activate a sprinkler head requires direct flame impingement okay. uh, at the head and only that head activates. Uh, unlike oh. the movies where you hold a lighter up to right. one and they all go off, yeah. uh, that's not how it works in reality. Yeah. Um, so only the head that is being impinged by heat uh, and the sprinkler systems, you know, both commercial and residential, are typically not designed to put the fire out, but more than 90% of the time they do put the fire out at a single head or um, in a commercial occupancy, depending on the occupancy type, uh, multiple. Um, so to that, the other piece I would add on the, the residential sprinkler piece, understanding some of the concerns, the, the residential code as written is written as a complete package where the fuel load assumes it's protected by sprinklers. So as the residential code was modified to allow for lighter weight construction, glue lamb, um, some of those types of construction techniques that allow for cheaper construction. The code was designed assuming that that lightweight construction would be protected by sprinklers. And I, I think a slight tweak on, on a phrase that was said earlier, I would not consider this adding the sprinklers back in. This would be returning it back in. It's always been there. Re single family dwellings having sprinklers has been in the code since 2009. Uh, we have chosen to remove it specifically since then. So this would just be no longer making that exception. Um, it's not an additional requirement that's unique uh, to our community. It's how the code was written. Right. Well, thank you for the help on the sprinkler system. Sure thing. I was thinking the movies. Yeah. yeah. Nope, yeah. I understand. Um, <laughs> I would still probably be against in the single family, you know, or adding it back in. I can see connection. I can even see duplexes because I do think that there's more chance of a fire in those. Um, I think with the expense of building and all these things we're adding, 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 expense of building going up, and I understand the value of a life. Let's not get into that discussion again. But I just think that to for single dwelling, that wouldn't be my preference either. My question. Well, oh. just, I right. just want to clarify if, if it, we don't have it in and the people that have contracted to have their belt house built, they could put it in if they want to. Oh, strongly so, recommend. So that's, yeah. So it doesn't make it so it can't be put into the building. Uh, my question actually is related to that as well. And it has to do with a pretty similar scenario. But um, let's just say a kid uh, kicks a ball in the house, goes up and smokes a sprinkler head. Those do activate. They can activate. Um, my question is really on the insurance side, is that all of a sudden some kind of add-on or what, 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 how does that ultimately work out um, if there's some kind of incidental yeah. uh, activation of the sprinkler system and it causes significant water damage to the house? Yeah, so on, on that, I would say that's a conversation between the homeowner and the insurance company more specifically on that. Uh, I can say that some sprinkler systems are designed in such a way to help avoid things like that. They can either be recessed with a cap that falls off at a certain temperature so that they're protected, um, and which is why usually if you go to a hotel room and they're all sticking out, they have all these things of don't put your hanger here because 
you can set a sprinkler head off. Um, residential sprinklers as well uh, do not have the same kind of flow rates as commercial sprinkler heads. So again, when you think about the, the volume of water that's coming out in a movie, uh, it's typically not that in a residential system. You're usually looking at between seven and 11 gallons a minute, um, uh, as opposed to the hose that we're bringing in that's 150 to 180 gallons a minute. Um, on that note, while you're up here, Chief Wolf, I think, I'm sorry that I can't find it in my notes. I was okay. combing through the many discussions we've had about <laughs> this and the long mm -hmm. sets of notes that I've taken, but we talked a little bit about houses that are um, on a well, if you could talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned how much water it goes through um, and that not being a problem for a house that's not on town water, for example. And then the cost of a residential sprinkler system on ever, and depending on the house, I know there's like a million different sure. factors, but in general, how, and especially how that, that compares to commercial sprinkler systems, which I think we often default to thinking about. Sure, um, so first on the residential piece, uh, they can be done without being connected to a municipal water supply uh, because of the requirements of the, the 13D system. Um, it's uh, typically adequate to have somewhere between 300 and 500 gallons, uh, which is a, not a not a small tank, but a you know can be managed off a well. Um, so uh, right now we we already use that in more rural parts of the district where we're unable to get the access and we can't get a driveway that a fire truck can get up. Then those are are typically required to be sprinklered as is. And so as of right now, um, we are we're putting we're seeing those start to occur with higher frequency around the district. Uh, as far as costs, I don't have those numbers for the Estes Valley. I think depending on where you are, front range numbers are probably in the dollar fifty two dollars a square foot on a new construction, not a retrofit, but new construction. Um, with the the mountain discount, I just assume double it. Uh, <laughs> so we're we're probably looking in the the three to four dollar range per square foot. So again, for you know a standard two thousand square foot house, we might be in the the six thousand dollar range. Um, but that's gonna. That'll vary by contractor and complexity of the house and how the house is laid out as well because the sprinklers are based on compartments. And so the more compartmented your house is, the more complicated the sprinkler system is. Um, so, so that's one of those that makes the cost hard to estimate. Sure. Uh, I think one of the other pieces on the cost that uh, typically gets ignored in these conversations is as they become more common and more people are doing them, that'll actually help with some of the costs because there'll be more options for contractors and it'll be more standard practice. As long as it's a one-off, that also helps keep some of those costs high. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an option three gal myself. Um, that's what I'd like to see. And I'm probably gonna be outruled on this from the board, but I'd like to see uh, sprinklers in single family new construction. Residential, please. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Wolf. The, the, um, does the fire district, can the fire district impose a requirement of sprinkling single family over our jur jurisdiction <clears throat> or I was thinking special you mean, districts can. You know, for example, if the town chooses not to, could the fire district? Yes. So the, the way that code adoptions are done for special districts is that uh, after our board adopts a code, of, a code through resolution, that code has to be ratified by both the municipality and the county that we cover. So even if our, our board chose to, it would still come back to this board for ratification um, and as well as the county. And that's where, uh, when the, the county chief building official was here, one of the things that he spoke to is um, the, the way it could work is that if the town was to adopt sprinklers, that would, the county would allow the fire district to adopt sprinklers district wide, not just within the town. So um, we would put sprinklers into the fire code for outside of the town uh, if the town already had sprinklers to keep the entire valley consistent. Um, but you know, if, if the town board does not choose to include it, we, we wouldn't be able to do it without town board's blessing, so no problem. And just because there was another question on it, um, single family dwelling fires make up 70% uh, of structure fires nationally. Um, so just real quick, we, we talked about this 2000 average. Is that Estes Park new build average Square footage is two thousand feet. I mean, we keep using this two thousand as average. I just wonder if we get if we're getting that number. I hate to say out of the way because I know y'all are just making these numbers up in your head. I get it, but I'm just trying to see if it's 
if that's what the square local footage yeah talking. square footage right yeah. i okay. got that part but if it's is it that the average new build in estes for a single family is two thousand i mean not attached i, I would say um average would be between two thousand maybe 2,500, because you've got some 4,000 square foot. Right. And a lot of them are built with unfinished basements. Even though the square footage is there, it's not considered livable space, you know. So, um, but your average home being built nowadays is about 2,000 square feet. Okay. That's a three bedroom, two bath, you know, family room, mm -hmm. dining room, fit, open concept basically. Okay. I, I just, I don't see a whole bunch of new builds going up in Estes. Mm -hmm. So I always wonder what is the average. Well, <laughs> a lot of the homes that are going up are larger homes. Um, those are the, the, probably the ones that would be an easier sell to sprinkle, mm -hmm. especially if they're unoccupied a lot of the time of the year. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Um, what some jurisdictions have done is they've done away with the sprinklers out of the residential house, but they require that the contractor offer it to the bill or to the home buyer. They would have to sign a paper that states, we, off, we recommend sprinklers, they're not required by code, and get the, the homeowner to sign off on that. So at least they're offering it to the homeowner. And that could be put in our code that way. Okay. That if, if we don't want to sprinkle them by code, then make the contractors, at least in their contract, offer it to the homeowner. Yeah. And then it's the homeowner's choice. Yeah, I like that. And I like that we strongly recommend it. I mean, years ago, I probably would have been against requiring smoke detectors in houses. Granted, this probably saved a gazillion lives. So I would have been wrong. You know, one in a million times, I could be wrong. But... <laughs> well, you know, yeah, our, but I do think it's important I, that we that we strongly recommend it, and sure. I think that's. I think it recommend it. You know, talk to your insurance company and find out if if my home was sprinklered, what would it cost? What would my insurance be? Maybe, maybe less. Could be lower. Um, if you go down thirty six in lines right before you get the lines, look to the right. Last week, yeah, big I house burned it. down, mm -hmm. non sprinkler. Well, that's an actually so. interesting fact that it might be nice for us to even know as a board, honestly. If we can check with two or three insurance companies in the area and mm -hmm. see if it's cheaper to insure a house that's sprinkled, because that makes maybe make a difference in what I'm thinking about the cost of building a house. If I found out that it's cheaper to insure it than it is sprinkled, yeah. you know, maybe that would change my mind as to whether I require yeah. it or not. And you got to remember a lot of a lot of stuff that's in the code is put in the code from insurance companies, so they don't have to pay out all these big insurance. So, a lot of them will recommend sprinklers because they understand the concept that you know it's the old one goes off they all go off well if the fire is big enough you want them all to go off and it's and it's to save the people not the house give time fire to get there and someone to get out of the home so so could we get some of those statistics uh, significantly before the may 23rd sorry i will yes yeah. Yes. I, what? Matter of fact, one of the one of our contractors in town um, puts them in most of his homes that he builds, and a lot of it is up, you know, outside of town too. He told us in our meeting last year, it's about four dollars a square foot additional. So, Chief Wolf was talking about two two fifty. Up here, it's about four dollars. But the more people use it lower the price is going to come just like solar and everything else you know demand will, will drive that market so trustee we will do our best to get that information I will get to what you I can. we have builders that are looking at it because you know with the whole code they were looking at the insulation everything so they're they're and they're more on board now than they were at the beginning because they realize it's not that much more expensive for a lot of these things that so as, a, as a board I'm Get that other information. Well, yeah, I know it's okay. Oh, it wasn't until somebody just put it on. Thank <laughs> no, thank you so much. <laughs> I think as as a board, we could probably consider tabling this until that information comes in. I think there's enough concern about it. Can we do that, Mayor? We, if the board tables the public setting the public hearing, uh, you're going to bump up against the deadlines for the July adoption. We won't. We won't have time to well, adopt we it. We won't have time. No. 
We, but, but what I will do is my darndest to make sure we get that information to you and we'll just include it in a, in a uh, board update, a weekly update. Yeah, that's fine. Because we can still change it at the hearing, correct? Yes, I mean, you can. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, and I just think if you can even get the insurance information, that would be huge for me because it's not like everybody doesn't believe that it's going to save lives. I, I think it will save lives, and I think that's important, but I do think there's a cost effect that we need to find out. Um, going back to Trustee Hazleton's comment as far as what option she's in favor of, I'm an option, or I'm, I'm in favor of option three as well, um, but I'm not in favor of uh, currently uh, having uh, single family homes sprinklered. I'm not sure if when we make this motion for to set a public hearing for ordinance, whatever the, the, this ordinance on February 23rd, if we May 23rd. May 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. I don't want to go back. Yeah, if we could uh, <laughs> potentially have at least those two options available, option three, but then with and without sprinklers for, mm -hmm. it seems like we have some further discussion there. Absolutely. Um, and I'd be happy to make a uh, motion to s set that February. Okay. Sandy? Are you sure? Yeah. I was just getting it on there. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so I move to set the public hearing for ordinance 04-23 for May 23rd, 2023. Second. It's been moved and seconded to set the hearing for May 23rd, 2023. Is there any more discussion? Let's take a vote then, please. Mayor, be, uh, briefly, I just also just need to clarify, do you have a preference for the option? Because I know we've heard from a couple of the trustees, but that will help us to clarify I, what I like option back. three and still questioning sprinkling. Okay, so that that's part of the motion? Just no, enough. he didn't make it part of the motion. That's right, and Mayor, those can be separate. There can be uh, a vote on the motion and in theory the, the direction could conclude after that is figured out or it can happen beforehand. Okay, well, let's just continue on with this motion and then we can talk about the other. I think that's the easy way to do it. Sure. Go for it. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. And it passes unanimously, so it's set for the 23rd of May. And now let's talk about the direction. So I'm also in favor of option three, and I'm a little bit on the fence on the um, smoke detector piece, although I'm, I think in my okay. heart of hearts, I've spring, what did I say? Smoke detector. Oh, geez, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Your fault. Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm more inclined to say that despite everything, I would rather have the, in all the houses, but I'm waiting to get some more data. Thank you. Okay. And I think everybody's commented on that. So, Mayor, if I could summarize uh, what I'm planning to bring back in a revised ordinance for the May 23rd meeting. Uh, based on this direction, th so what's in the ordinance currently is the kitchen sink because we wanted to make sure we didn't leave anything out. Um, but we will remove RB and CB from that ordinance. We will remove additional edits to the International Energy Conservation Code that were presented by SWEEP that we put in your packet for you because those largely related to RB and CB, we will continue to include the Colorado model code mm -hmm. and the, sprinkler, uh, the sprinklers will remain in the code as they are currently, although we will be prepared to act on the fly if the board wishes to make that amendment at the meeting on the 23rd. Okay. I'll perfect. note one more thing, which is a, a little bit of an aberration. The Colorado Code Board that puts together that model code has not officially published that code yet, which is why it's in there as the final draft. <laughs> we understand that there are not expected to be changes uh, of any significance between the final draft and the published code. And if we need to come back and clean it up and change it from the final draft to the published code at some point, that shouldn't be a big issue. So 
but we would uh, have it set up for adoption as that final draft that has been published online. Okay. And, and to confirm the sweep provisions, we'll consider at a later date. Correct, as I understand it, Correct. Trustee Hazelton. It, We're moving not on just the so there are sweep, and Christine, if you'd like to correct me or have anything to add, that would be wonderful. Um, but as I understand it, there are sweep recommendations if the town wanted to go in the direction not just of electric ready, but of electric preferred. We could, if we go in this direction, we could consider those at a later date. We would also consider RC and CC. Mm -hmm at a later date as well. And since the, if we go in this direction and do adopt the 2021 energy code and the Colorado model code, then we'll already be adopting everything the state wants us to adopt at this time. So we could make changes in the future without any significant impact on the existing code at that time. Okay, great, thanks. Sounds perfect. Okay, thank you, and thanks for the additional comments that you all made. It's very confusing. Thanks for coming up tonight. Drive home carefully. <laughs> all right. Let's move ahead to reports and discussion. We have two more to consider. The Estes Park Board of Trustees Vacancy Letters of Interest. Jackie Williamson, town clerk. Thank you, Mayor and Board. Um, so as you stated, we're here to uh, review next steps in filling this vacancy. I'd like to just take a moment to remind uh, the board and the public, um, the reason we got to this point is at your April 11th meeting, I brought forward um, your options to fill the vacancy that we currently have. Um, as a statutory community, we only have two options that the board can consider, which is either appointment to fill this vacancy until the next election or to hold a special election. We received direction at that last meeting on April 11th to go ahead and move forward with letters um, of interest in order to fill it by appointment. So in your packet, you have the names of those individuals that submitted um, their letters of interest. I'll take a moment just to read through there. There's nine of them. So by alphabetical order, you have William Brown, Bruce Darby, Nathan Harger, Hager, Harger, excuse me, John Howell, Frank Lancaster, John Meisner, Ward Nelson, Kurt Radish, and Jason Van Tatenhoven. So I did wanna make sure that the board knew that I did ensure that the minimum requirements are met by all nine of these individuals. So we did check to make sure that they've lived here for the required time and that they're registered voters and such, okay? Um, also in our April 11th memo, we stated that the board can give us further direction at this time on things such as how you wanna move forward, whether or not you wanna have public um, a public interview process, for example, or any other such um, I, you know, items or next steps. Uh, as a reminder, you have 60 days to make this appointment from when it was vacated, and that date is May 26th, okay? So I did put in a little bit of a sample calendar for you all to consider. If you did wanna move forward with a public interview process, we would probably need to hold a special town board meeting uh, for you all to consider that. If you did wanna move through that interview process, um, I did make a recommendation in there that we would uh, maybe conduct a 15 to 20 minute interview process, uh, three, four questions, something like that, um, that we could put together for the board and you could um, hold those as a public hearing, or not a public hearing, but as a public, public. meeting. Um, in lieu of that, I did give you one other option that, that you can consider. Uh, we could also pose those questions and have written responses presented to you to consider and then come together and, and consider that and make a vote at an upcoming meeting. Your next meeting is May 9th. Um, then you also have May 23rd as your final date to make a decision. Uh, 
I've kind of laid it out for you all to hopefully maybe make a decision by May 9th if it's possible, only, only so that we could have that person sworn in and be at your May 23rd meeting. Um, that, of course, is, is an optional timeline. You guys can consider that. Um, and really what we need tonight from the board is how you would like to move forward um, in considering these nine applicants. Okay, I'm happy to you. answer any questions. Okay. Um, I want to interview process at your session meeting. And I mean, my, my want would be, I mean, we can make, um, you know, questions available ahead of time, but I'd like to have also questions on the fly because we all know that you get questions on the thought fly and I'd like to know how people actually think, not how they've prepared answers. Um, so, or how somebody else has prepared answers for them, which can happen too. So that's what would be my thought process. Um, okay. 15, 20 minutes per applicant for nine applicants. It's a three hour meeting, so it's uh, significant. So we wanna probably keep it to a minimum of 15, 20 minutes, but um, that would be my preference. Yeah. yeah, that's my preference also. I agree. Uh, yeah, I think that would be great. I don't know if it's possible, I know this is probably gonna make town staff roll their eyes a little bit since we just got rid of Zoom participation at meetings, but if something like this could be done virtually so that it could be recorded, we're all zooming in on it, it could be recorded, the public could tune in as a webinar. I think a big reason, I think Marie's points are great. I think the other piece is the transparency of that too, that it's, um, that the community can participate in a way of viewing it, submitting their feedback to us, those kinds of things too, that'd be, a value to me. If that's not possible, I understand, but I think some sort of way that folks could um, have an opportunity to tune in, and if it's not in this room virtually, um, that has merit for me. Could, could I get some clarity on that? Because our, our meetings are already recorded, recorded and are available on YouTube. Is it just so they can watch, or is there a, a, something else that you're hoping to get out of a Zoom meeting? I'm thinking if it's impossible for all of us to be in a room for a three-hour meeting uh. between now and the ninth, if it's possible for people to be in a virtual room that's recorded in a webinar format so people can still tune in, but we can all engage in a way, that's my thought. If we can all get in a room for a three-hour span of time between now and May 9th, Cool. <laughs> I, I think Sounds it's in, great. <laughs> I think it's important uh, thank for, you for us the to all be in the in the room. We're here tonight for with the study session that long, so I would like to see us all, and I'd like to see the candidates make that commitment to come into the meeting because it's important. Uh, the question that I have is, it will be a discussion between the trustees and the candidates versus public comment, correct? Well, that, that would That's be up to the board, but that right. would be up to the board, but it would be staff's recommendation that it would be more of an interview I setting so. for you all um, to ask questions and get some feedback uh, from the, each candidate. Good. And we would just bring them okay. into the room one at a time um, so that they weren't here um, listening to the other candidates right. and the other answers. Right. Any difference in direction or? Oh, yeah, I, I agree. The public interview process I think would be the best. Um, going way back, I mean, my ideal thing to happen, I guess, would be a, an election, but. Um, well, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, I think that's, obviously we're not gonna do that. <laughs> we're already going down this path, so. Um, yeah, I think a public interview just uh, would be the best, most transparent way to do it, and go from there. I agree with that. I think the timing's gonna be the sticky wicket. Oh, it is. <laughs> so can we address the possibilities on that? So. I'll be fine. Second yeah, I was just gonna suggest scrapping the next study session and potentially hosting all the interviews at the study session time prior to our next meeting on the 9th and then taking action that evening. And so I do not have the study session in front of me, so I apologize <laughs> if there's something really important on there. I believe there's the fee schedule and Yes, yeah, something with Vanessa. Uh, electric right. vehicle infrastructure and readiness update and the planning fee schedule. 
Well, We're good. Uh, if Jessica, I'll talk to Jessica, Director Gardner, tomorrow, and if the consultants need to come to talk about that, we can always tack it on to the end of the board meeting, uh, like we're doing with uh, Manager Soulsby's item tonight. So we we could use that May 9th meeting uh, study session rather for these interviews without much consequence. We would just need you all to be present, probably around. 3.30? Yeah. It would be an earlier start than normal. Let's, I mean, maybe we do that. Sounds good. Okay, is that, that works for everybody. Um, Question-wise, I just want to confirm for you all, um, do you want to see questions? Um, I've kind of prepared some based off of uh, some of the application information. Um, I also have about five pages of questions that um, North Glen, for example, has gone through this recently. Um, I'm happy I could send those to you all. You guys could pick out your top four or five and then we could go from there and we can consolidate those and, and move forward with some questions. Um, if, there's, if you guys don't have any, a lot of input on that or don't have any concern, staff can definitely put those together and, and bring forward what, what uh, questions we think are viable questions, but we'd love to hear from the board. I still think um, not having them prepared first is pretty important. All of us have been through the the women voters that have been up here, and we yeah. do not have prepared questions. So I think it's kind of important for the candidates to be, I mean, I don't mind if there's a, a prepared question, whatever, but I think there should be opening for maybe not that list, but questions that are unprepared for the candidates because all of us have been through it. Um, so I think it's kind of important to see how they think and not how they prepared. Well, I wasn't say I wasn't suggesting no, giving them that. the questions, just that you have general questions that you're asking each sure. of them to get get a feel for um, specific, spe yeah, specific um, items that I think the board would be um, interested in knowing about each candidate. Perfect. And then you can definitely ask follow-up questions from there. So I like, the, I like having you send us mm -hmm. some questions. questions and we can circle it and you guys can, We can know, consolidate, the, consolidate the top it. picks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do we want to have four or five consolidated questions that everybody will be asked? as well as then our own spontaneous question. Four. Okay. Four. <laughs> Four? Yeah, we don't have much time. You know, some people go on and on, including myself. So, no, I think we need to <laughs> Brevity is always a good deal on this. And if we have suggestions ahead of time as to questions that we think might be relevant, can we go ahead and send those to you? Yes, okay, of course. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure the board has is getting the information they need from these right. interview processes. Um, so that you can make a decision. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you. And our final person is Vanessa, and she'll be doing the Estes Transit branding project update. Hello. Okay. Hello. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> uh, good, good evening, Mayor and Trustees. Vanessa Soulsby. I'm the Mobility Services Manager, Department of Public Works. This last item is going to be so fun, so I hope you guys are ready and still awake. I know that was a long discussion, but I'm here this evening to update you all on the um, process and project to create a brand for Estes Transit. Um, this item would have typically come to you at a study session, but you were very busy earlier today. And as it's only, I think, like 31 days until Memorial Day, this is a timely issue because we'd like to roll some of these recommendations out this summer. So um, this particular project to create a new brand for Estes Transit was identified as part of the 2022 Town Board Strategic Plan. We did kick off the project last year. We hired um, a consultant, Slate Communications, and you'll hear from Ryan Burke, um, our lead consultant here in a moment. He's actually gonna walk you through this presentation. They were hired through a competitive process and have just done a phenomenal job for us. And before I turn it over to Ryan, I just want to give you guys the really quick um, version of why are we doing this? Why do we need a brand for Estes Transit? Number one, to increase ridership for visitors and locals. We spend a lot of money on transit from a variety of different local, state, and federal sources, and we want to be really good stewards of the funds that we're spending on transit. 
Number two, we wanna increase awareness of our transit options. Nobody likes seeing buses without people on them uh, more, than, <laughs> more than I do. That is the, the thing that I don't wanna see, especially with some upcoming years of construction, the downtown parking challenges we have. I wanna see full buses and I'd like to see more buses and we need to let people know buses they can get on, where they're going and make it a really stress-free experience. And then lastly, we need to have a little bit of fun. Riding transit is a joyful experience if you've done it with small children lately. They love to ride a bus, any bus, put them on a bus. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. And so we wanna create an experience that matches the nostalgic charm of our community and really engages people to ride transit, um, not just to get around, but also as part of the experience of visiting our town. So those are the three main goals of this project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan. He's gonna walk you through some exciting pieces of the process, our public engagement, and show you some visuals um, that we're hoping to see on a bus near you this summer. And then lastly, I wanna say a big thank you to our branding committee. We had a really diverse group. We had um, bus operators. We had several members of TAB, including one member who has national branding experience. We had town staff, our public inter information officer. And we really put our consultant through the ringer, <laughs> as you'll hear. They were very patient with us and included all of our feedback. So thank you to that committee. They've been working since December on this project. And I know many of them wanted to be here tonight but are stuck in various transit situations. So not transit bus situations, but in transit. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Hi, thank you for fitting me in tonight. Appreciate it. I will try to make this as painless as possible and quick, and then we can just start the conversation if that sounds okay. good. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, as Vanessa had said, I'm Ryan Burke. I am one of the founders of Slate Communications. Uh, we have 10 other people on our team that are based out of Fort Collins. Uh, we have experience with more than six other transit agencies within Colorado uh, for marketing, communications, and branding. And so it is our privilege to work with Vanessa and her team and the brand committee to help really discover what your transit brand is about. And so we'll go over briefly, it's a very short uh, PowerPoint, but just our process. And we wanted to make sure that, that there was some clarity around the fact that we did reach out to your community, we formed a brand committee, and we really made sure that we did our research and due diligence to really provide a brand that works for your transit system. So we talked to stakeholders within Estes, um, we, uh, Vanessa and her team, put together a brand committee, which we've met with multiple times. And then based upon those discussions, uh, we developed the first round of bus design wraps. Um, we met with the brand committee to review those with them. Um, and then at this point, we're meeting with the group here just to present the final selection from the brand committee for the bus wrap design. And what we're gonna do based upon that is we're gonna further expand and blow up that brand for a new logo, um, the collateral when it comes to the route maps, the route signage, anything that you see that, that pertains to the transit system in Estes Park. And so just to reiterate a little bit, uh, stakeholders, who did we talk to? Uh, of course we talked to um, the brand committee members. These are some members of staff, but also some members from the community that are active in with the transit system as well as people from the transportation uh, board as well. Uh, we had a couple meetings with TAB, um, but the 10 stakeholder interviews, uh, this is the chamber director, the, ED, uh, the economic development director, uh, people from Rocky Mountain National Park, from the visitor center, lodging, retail. We wanted to make sure that we got a pretty well-rounded uh, basis of knowledge when it comes to who is using transit, who needs to use transit, and who your visitors are. So who who are we really trying to reach out to? And based upon those conversations, we had five, five major takeaways. Um, we really found that residents don't use the transit system as much as, as visitors do, uh, as much as the J1 students. Uh, people that are coming to Estes, they're really seeking out a nostalgic experience. So they're experiencing that in Elkhorn, they're experiencing that in Rocky Mountain National Park. How can we actually give that, that kind of experience as well when they're riding transit? You know, we have the trolley already, which is a great vehicle. It definitely, people are excited to ride that. But how do we actually create this, this more visual that, that really entices people to get on a bus? Um, another thing we wanna do is we wanna get people to park. We want them to stop driving everywhere. So how do we get the people that are visiting to utilize the parking garage, stay at the hotel? 
hop on the bus, utilize that to get around. And then of course, as we talked to a lot of stakeholders within the community, um, we also found that uh, this is a tight-knit community and we want to make sure that as we market and communicate the transit system, that we're doing a lot of grassroots marketing and communications. And then lastly, uh, we know that the J1 employees as well as some of the non-English speaking visitors really do rely on the transit system. So how do we make it easier for them to actually better understand it? And so that really is one of our, our biggest challenges. So when we talked to everybody, uh, these are some of the, the key words that we had heard um, when it came to the actual transit system is that it is really great for visitors. People do rely on it. Uh, it has that nostalgic theme when it comes to the trolley, um, but it's also an experience. I think a lot of people that are coming from the region and around the country don't normally use transit. So how do we actually involve that uh, and make it a little bit more of a journey when they're utilizing the system? It's definitely underutilized. Uh, but one thing that we heard is that a lot of the operators just have a very friendly approach and friendly demeanor when it comes to, to the riders and to their interactions. So I think the professional level of the operators is also really one of your strong characteristics of the transit system. And so we want to bank on that as well. When we really look at the target markets, we, we wanted to categorize them in the three different um, markets. We have the primary uh, markets, which are the visitors and the J1 students. And so when you look at a majority of your visitors that are coming from Texas and Missouri and California, they're coming from areas that don't normally utilize transit systems. So how are we going to change that behavior? How are we really going to motivate them to utilize buses to, to, to keep them off the road, keep their cars as far away from possible as from, from the park and, and Elkhorn? Um, so it's really trying to change that behavior and making it a more welcoming experience for them. Uh, for J1 students, I also want to kind of put in some non-English speaking uh, visitors as well with the J1 students. People that are accustomed to using transit systems, but they necessarily don't uh, speak our language. So how do we make it easy for them to associate the routes, the places they need to go with the actual buses they need to get on? And you'll see some examples of that. We put residents as a secondary market uh, just because, you know, they're, they're definitely, they're a little bit more resistant to riding in transit. However, that's, that we're not going to discount them. We're just going to focus on the two primary markets um, initially and then go into a phase two for communications and marketing for, for residents as well. So as we spoke with the brand committee, we met with TAB, we really tried to to figure out what is the character and how can we illustrate the character of your town. You know, obviously we have Long's Peak and we have Rocky Mountain. Um, we have Elkhorn, we have the residents here, we have nature, we have the recreation, we have trails out our front door. So what we really want to do is we want to make sure that, that we can actually take these colors, these fe the feel of, of what it is like to live here to experience the outdoors and bring it into a brand and then utilize this brand, this vision board that you see here and be able to emulate that with the actual design of the bus wraps. And then further along the road is actually bring that into the logo design as well. And so if you look at these images, I hope this does speak Estes Park to you. I hope this does look like Estes Park. I hope it looks like Park, Rocky Mountain National Park, but also Estes as well. Um, your neighbors, what you do, what you appreciate about living here. So the first, uh, we're going to show two designs. One is the trolley and one is uh, the brown shuttle. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure to uh, make it really understandable more than anything that you have a red route, which is the trolley. You have a brown route, you have a gold, you have a silver, and you have a blue route. And so each of these buses will actually have a color. And so let's say you're not English speaking and you see a brown bus approaching, you know that's the brown route. Or if you look at the map and you see, uh, you know, an elk such as this one, um, and that is part of the key map to the route and what you're looking at. Or if the visitor center guide tells you, hey, just get on the brown shuttle or get on the brown bus, it has an elk on it, it's a, little, it's a lot more easy to understand. And as you can see with this bottom illustration here, this is a brown bus approaching you. Same with the, with the red trolley as well. People are really going to understand colors. They're going to understand the iconography of the animals. But also really 
trying to make that fun too. So if you think about kids who do like to use public transportation, um, are really excited to do that, they wanna say, oh, I wanna get on the Red Fox, or I wanna get on the Brown Elk, or I wanna get on the Mountain Lion. And so we wanted to really create this more illustrative uh, bus wrap design and really integrate it into the current uh, design of the shuttles um, and make it, make it fun. And we also wanna make sure that we leave enough of the windows free of coverage so people can actually see outside and enjoy the vistas uh, in the area here. With both of these designs here, what we're doing is we're actually trying to create this kind of more nostalgic, nostalgic vintage um, route badge. So you can see the brown route here and the red route here. Uh, and so this will actually be connected with the route maps as well. It'll be on the route signs. So regardless if you speak English or not, um, you see you're, you're, you're waiting at the bus stop, maybe you're staying in a Verbo far away, um, you'll see the Brown Elk logo on your bus stop. You know that's the one you're gonna get on and when you wanna get back home, you're gonna get on the right bus. And so we were trying to think of creating the most versatile brand that we could that fits all these different categories of people that will be util utilizing the, the transit system. And lastly, uh, we worked with the brand committee on actually creating a name for the transit, transit agency. And so we went back and forth quite a bit trying to figure out what is the landmark, what is the feature that we can really emulate with the name of the transit agency. So, so we had a lot of ideas going back and forth with our committee and they settled on the peak. And so the peak is the umbrella name of the transit system for SS Park Transit. And within the peak, we have the, the different members of the animal kingdom in the different colors. So uh, for blue route, we have the blue bird. So that will be a kind of a larger blue bird um, on the bus. For the silver route, we have silver trout. For the in gold route, mountain lion, and so on and so forth. And so we wanna make sure that, that it is, there's a good amount of clarity. It feels like the, it really brings that outdoor characteristics of who you are, um, who your town is and we're gonna be able to bring that into the different uh, bus wrap designs. And so with that, uh, I would like just to leave it open to the floor just to discuss this a little bit and get your thoughts. Um, this is, I believe, the, the final selection from the brand committee out of, I think, you know, four or five different bus wrap designs that we had brought forth, and this is the one that they favored the most. But we'd love to hear your thoughts. I think it looks great. I do have one question. I noticed that you have fox prints on the front of the bus. I guess that's the front. And you have elk hooves on the brown one. What do you do with the bird and the fish? <laughs> uh, that's good. I, I think we could still do, uh, we, yeah, I, don't, I, I almost had a joke for the bird one. But um, <laughs> I think we could still do bird tracks. Uh, but for the fish, uh, I don't know. You know, you could have uh, bubbles. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, and the only, I think it's a great idea. I think it helps people that are colorblind. You know, they have other things to look at. Um, two concerns looking at, and this is totally in the, totally in the weeds, micromanaging. Um, the elk being that dark brown, would that show up on the black windows? <laughs> or would it have to be a lighter elk? That's number one. Number two is, um, and, and this is really picky, but I, I guess I don't know what a silver trout is. And so. Rainbow trout is what we have on well, there's no such thing as, I mean, silver trout are actually extinct animals. Yes. So I mean, I'm not saying that's because you're calling it a silver trout, but it, it is possible you could do rainbow trout or something, or even a brown trout, which we have brown, but I get this not the same color as the brown elk, but silver trout to me just looks kind of funny. I'm just right. totally in the weeds there, but it's the first thing that kind of hit my brain is like, silver trout is an extinct fish. So mm. I, would, I know it's in the weeds. <laughs> well, exactly. They're extinct fish. So I'm you like, have to be so knowledgeable. well, it just mm. seems kind of weird. It's like, yeah. you know, oh, don't look at me like I'm crazy, there, Patrick. I, I get oh, no, the I color. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I looked it up, and I was like, I don't think I've ever heard of a single fish, and, and it's a, yeah. it's an extinct fish. So I, I don't know. Just a thought. Rainbow trout, rainbow trout, trout, trout make it rainbow, they have multiple know. colors on them. Well, that might be the fun. first route that's replaced by another one. It's, it's <laughs> that route's becoming extinct. But that's a good point. We we did think and we assumed we thought the silver trout was actually still uh, in, uh, not extinct. So that's uh, good to know. So I would assume that we're gonna have to find some other kind of silver 
uh, base type of <laughs> I mean, animal I like the within fish the. Beyond there for sure. I just don't know if the silver is the right color for that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I did look it up, and I and I saw the definition that they're located out here. I didn't know that they no longer existed. That's a surprise. Yeah, well, I, I've never heard of them. That's why I looked it up. It's not like I, I mean, I used to do the actually a fish bet mm -hmm. in my former life, but I never yeah, I never actually heard of the fish silver trout. I looked it up, and it is an extinct trout. Mm -hmm. So I, I I like just saying the trout route. And mm -hmm. if you just got rid of the word silver sure. in front yeah, of trout, that's fine too. totally, yeah. totally works. works. And you can still make it silver. <laughs> just don't call it yeah, silver. Yeah, thank you. That's a great solution. <laughs> <laughs> don't scrap that file yet. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I the it. silver shark, we yeah. can get their kids really psyched. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. I can still call them silver trout. I mean, you're yeah. right. Exactly. I don't care what the color of the bus is. But. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was part of a community-wide brand strategy project that was really similar to the conversation that we're having now. Obviously not for transit, but getting um, personal opinions and feedback on it. So I want to say thanks for all your work on it. And I really appreciate that it's come from data and it's come from community feedback. So to me, this, I mean, if I'm just going to plant my personal opinion on it if I'm going to give you feedback at this point. But I like that the process has been followed in a way that engages the community and that it stays true to our roots. It pulls from data, it pulls from those things because um, it's one of the most impossible things to do can confirm, especially in this community, is how to get everyone on the same page. So um, <laughs> whether it's trout route or silver trout or whatever it is, I think the concept of, that you guys are trying to go after looks great and thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. And I think the fox is easily recognizable because red isn't for colorblind males. So I like the fact that there's a fox on there and it says Another, red fox. Um, consideration mayor for the badges was also for our colorblind patrons as well because each route will have a different badge shape yeah no I think yeah. that's great yeah no, I think it, it, it's great you, you know there's a you know frontier when it was a decent airline um, <laughs> you know well I'll say that until the public including the baseball I care um, but I remember when the kids were little it was always which plane we were on yeah you know yeah. we're on the dolphin they knew all the names so that's kind of cool yeah I think that's great the other thing that's nice about this is because our parking lots have animals, this is sort of a continuation of the animal theme, which is totally appropriate here. And it's very cool. I love that fox. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's great. Uh, just a, a question that's maybe a little bit out of this, but a while ago we were all looking to be able to put up timing systems, and now that we're expanding broadband different places, um, are we ever looking to having a sensor on top so that, and now on the street where they're picked up where they could see the time element? Are on? you talking about um, on route, like yeah, real time route. ride availability? Um, absolutely. So we um, just on April 6th published an RFP for a multimodal transportation plan and a transit development plan. And that sort of technology improvement is something that will be included in that planning process. And we'll be process. able to use it because of the broadband. I think that will be it's instrumental, but I also think too we've learned a lot of lessons from other transit agencies that have had vendors come and go. So I think mm -hmm. we're, as, as have we, we had a vendor that came and went. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to be better positioned with this process to find a vendor yeah. that works for us. Um, but Trailblazer's been a great partner for the Wapiti Wi-Fi extension downtown for the mm -hmm. paid parking program. So I think that everything they're doing is going to support our efforts um, to increase connectivity. And they're always willing to be creative. So hopefully they have good phone numbers for Verizon and T-Mobile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get that cellular piece too. But yes, that is on our radar for sure. And we'll be part okay. of a planning process. That's perfect. I yeah. like this yeah. plan. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And thank you all so much. We will come back again when we finish this process. But the last thing I wanted is for all of you to see these beautiful buses drive by and say, wait a second, nobody told me about these. So thank you for your input. Yeah. Um, we'll share uh, the logo and additional uh, marketing strategies um, when we conclude our work with the Slate team. So thank you guys so much for yeah. doing a great job like, for this us. This is really fun. So, thank Vanessa, you all. Yes. Can you remind me that is the thought to put these on buses for this year or for next year? For this year. It is, yes. Nice. Yes, we are hoping that to wrap the buses. Quick. So we are, especially <laughs> okay. since, you know, we've got buses coming and going, we lease vehicles. So okay. yes, we are going to try and put them on as many buses as we can this year. Okay. Uh, the trolleys in particular, the other vehicles may lag a little bit, but it is our intention to do that and really oh, start to great. roll out the new brochure, some additional signage to start to connect those pieces together visually for our riders. Great. Thank you. Yes. That's Thank great. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Okay. And I think that we should be done with our meeting. Is there anything else for the good of the order right now? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.